This is your ultimate stop for everything sports. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Should I say more? From the NFL, MLB, the NBA, to MMA. It's all in here. The Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Listen now. Thank you for listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast, where we discuss everything in the wide world of sports. I'm Ben. And I'm Anthony. And we are back here on a Friday, leading you into the weekend. Got a lot of great sporting events going on this weekend. As always, we have college football in the NFL Saturday and Sunday. We have UFC 204 on Saturday. We have Michael Bisping versus Dan Henderson for the middleweight title. We also have baseball. We have the playoffs going on. We had some games last night in the American League. Tonight we have the NLDS kicking off and then as well as more games in the American League. So we are going to start with Thursday Night Football from last night. We had the Cardinals and the Niners at Levi Stadium in Santa Clara. The Cardinals come out on top 33-21. to Really for the opening part of that game, for the first quarter and a half maybe, it was like literally a snooze fest. We had nine consecutive punts in a row between both teams. And then obviously the Cardinals spearheaded really by David Johnson. He absolutely had had a great game last night. 157 yards rushing, two touchdowns. Drew Stanton didn't do too much replacing Carson Palmer with the concussion injury, but he didn't make any mistakes. 124 yards, two touchdowns, Larry Fitzgerald. So the problem was that the 49ers just absolutely could not get anything going. And a lot of that is because of quarterback Blaine Gabbert. Yeah, so you look at it, actually, if you combine them both, if you combine Drew Stanton and Blaine Gappert, combine them and even throw for 300 yards. So neither of the offenses was really that good. You basically had four people who had, if you're going to go like fantasy football-wise, good games. You had David Johnson, who had over 150 yards, two touchdowns. Larry Fitzgerald, 81 and a couple touchdowns, like you mentioned. Jeremy Curley, 102 yards and a touchdown. And even Carlos Hyde, 78 and a touchdown. Those are the only four guys. Offensively, I should say, because defensively, they basically just had a field day. Everyone in Arizona, Calais Campbell and all them against Blaine Gabbard. But like you said, the offense stalled, nine straight punts between them both. You know, it basically became a blowout after the second half. But it was something where no matter what Blaine Gabbard tried to do, like he had a nice, you know, rushing touchdown in there. Uh, You saw some of the fans say, we want cap. They were kind of getting a little bit hostile with that. You know, the Niners, after that week one win against the Rams they have looked just like outside of maybe the Browns the worst team in the NFL yeah the San Francisco 49ers offense really in my eyes they really only have one guy Carlos Hyde who last night he didn't do too bad he had 78 yards and a touchdown he also had 36 yards receiving he was the second leading receiver on the team last night when I look at the 49ers offense obviously I I I know a lot of the storylines go towards Blaine Gabbert he's really struggled but Really, I think the whole entire offense, when I look at the San Francisco 49ers, they don't have anybody with the exception of Carlos Hyde that I I would want on my team if I were to redraft the entire team. Their offensive line is is not good. The Niners give up seven sacks last night. They give up a safety at the end of the game. They can't get anybody going. Torrey Smith is their best receiver. He didn't even have a catch last night. Jeremy Curley put up a good game. He had 100 yards in the score, roughly. But other than that, there's nobody else on that team that really gets me excited. And I realize a lot of that starts with the quarterback. But if you don't have anybody around you, how well can you really do? Right. Yeah, and you look at it, Blaine Gabber through the whole season. He only has one game over 200 yards passing against the Carolina Panthers. Everything else, 170, 196, 162, and 119. So he's struggled. Yeah, like you said, the offense around him hasn't been that good. Jeremy Curley seems to be somebody he's targeting a little bit more. And, you know, yeah, you can get Carlos Hyde out of the backfield. Torrey Smith not helping him out. At all, it's, you know, maybe not all on Blaine Gabbard because the offense around him isn't great, but, I mean, he's also been really just struggling really badly. Yeah, so Gabbard this season is only completing 58% of his passes. He's got five touchdowns and six interceptions. Quarterback rating of 69. Right. So (laughs) definitely not, not good at all. So everybody's screaming for Colin Kaepernick, and now with 10 days to prepare for their next game coming next Sunday against Buffalo. Mm hmm. I honestly do expect 
Kaepernick to be the starting quarterback. Chip Kelly said after the loss last night that they're examining everything in the whole entire offense. He didn't think anybody in particular played well last night on the offensive side of the ball. Really on the defensive side, too, you lose your best player in Navarro Bowman for with an Achilles injury out mm-hmm. for the year. So you have that to sort of overcome. But then on on offense, you can't get anything going forward. I would bring in Colin Kaepernick, and here's why, for two reasons. Okay. Number one, you have Blaine Gebert actually running the ball this year. Mm-hmm. He was he he had a touchdown last night. And he also had about 50, 60 yards. So you have Blaine Gabbert actually running the ball, and by no means is Blaine Gabbert a running quarterback. Right. Not at all. Maybe he's a little shifty, but you look at Colin Kaepernick, he has the ability to run. Think about what he did to Green Bay in the playoffs a few years ago. He absolutely lit him up. And with this offense, it's made shift for Colin Kaepernick for a running quarterback. So you have Colin Kaepernick there. He has the ability to run, which Blaine Gabbert and Myers really doesn't. So you have that going in your favor. And number two, you have Blaine Gabbert with five touchdowns, six interceptions, 56% completion percentage, as I mentioned. Can Colin Kaepernick possibly do any worse? Probably not. Like, that's the thing. The one problem is you're going up against Buffalo. Like, I understand you have 10 days. You're going against Buffalo, who, if you look at the Buffalo Bills throughout the season, yes, they had a bad game against the Jets. They lost 37-31. But every other game, they only gave up 13 to the Baltimore Ravens. They only gave up 18 to the Cardinals. And they shut out the Patriots. So even though their defense hasn't been maybe up to par as far as like old Rex Ryan defenses, their defense is still really good. And now you're going to throw, I understand you have 10 days rest, but you're going to throw Colin Kaepernick into that. Because there's basically two different times where you would assume that Kaepernick would get the start. Because you always want to do it on kind of like a long rest period. You don't necessarily, like you wouldn't throw it to him if they had, you know, say last week where they had Thursday night this week and you wouldn't do it on like seven days rest. So you have this potential time where you have 10 days against the Buffalo Bills, or you tell Blaine Gabbert, all right, you got two more chances. You got Buffalo next week, and then after that you have Tampa Bay. And if both of those things fall off, then they have the bye week, and then you come back against the Saints, who the Saints have a really bad defense, that can give Colin Kaepernick some confidence if he comes back then. So I would say, look, you're already one and four. Probably have no hope of going to the playoffs anyways, right? So throw Blaine Gabbert twice more, you know, and see if that works. And if still after two weeks you have no hope and everything's terrible and you're one and six, then throw Colin Kaepernick out there, like I said, against a bad Saints defense, build him up confidence-wise against that because then right after that you're going to be in Arizona against the Cardinals. I see what you're saying. I Honestly, I would just do the, the change now because you have really, in my eyes, nothing to lose and something to gain by it because you're getting no play from your quarterback right. whatsoever. You haven't even looked good since week one. They lost by seven to the Cowboys, not too bad. But every other game, they've been losing by at least double digits. Yeah. So you're not looking good, really, with the exception of one game last week against Dallas. I say just make the change. You have a week and a half to prepare, get him up to speed, get him running, practice with the first team. I say I say go for it because you really aren't getting anything out of Blaine Gabbert. Everybody wants the change. Mm-hmm. Kaepernick is made for this system, a spread system, something he ran in college at Nevada. I think it's time to make the change because I don't think it can get any worse than what you're already seeing from the quarterback play. And maybe with the addition of a new guy coming in, maybe the players are kind of going to be motivated more because they would like to see that change as well, sort of behind the scenes. Obviously, they're not going to be public about that. But I'm sure they have in their eyes, man, you know, I wish Cap was down, was like actually quarterbacking us. Like maybe we could be a little more explosive on offense you know I, I don't know I'm just speculating of course but definitely not not a good situation I would expect a change to happen sooner rather than later I I doubt Blaine Gabbard is starting quarterback week 17 oh yeah no totally absolutely not and like you said like Blaine Gabbard for or for uh, Colin Kaepernick I mean for everything that's happened with him bad even just talking about on the field all the stuff that's happened bad over the last couple of years we've seen him like you said against Green Bay where he basically just ran against that whole defense and beat him by himself so we've seen Kaepernick, when he's at his best, be really good. We've never actually seen Blaine Gabbard be an elite quarterback in the NFL. We've seen him struggle in Jacksonville. Fine, probably the offensive line, the whole team around him helps that. But we've never seen Blaine Gabbard be an exceptional quarterback. We've seen that with Colin Kaepernick. And maybe the team's like, okay, look, I get that maybe he's not as good as he is right now, but we still have seen him be that good. We want to see if he can still be that guy, see if he can actually channel some of that old – Jim Harbaugh kind of confidence that he had and just bring that because that's one thing that we always thought with Chip Kelly was 
whatever quarterbacks he's had, they've been the kind of mobile quarterbacks like he had over in Oregon and Kaepernick's like the perfect kind of like fill in pro quarterback to do stuff like that. Yeah, I think I think Kaepernick's definitely that guy. As far as Chip Kelly goes, I realize he's trying to implement his own systems and schemes here in the NFL, mm-hmm. and obviously he's going to want to be in the NFL, but I really don't think Chip Kelly's an NFL coach. I think he's just really made for college. I think maybe after the Niners eventually get rid of him, who knows how long it'll be. I think it'll maybe be a couple of years because this team, I don't see them winning anytime soon, even for years to come. Right. I think Chip Kelly goes back to college, and I think he's a stud. I think there's just some guys that are made for the college game, some guys that are made for the NFL game, and sa- same thing with basketball too. You know, Rick Pitino is mm-hmm. a legend at Louisville and Kentucky. When he went to Boston, he just didn't have it. You know, Calipari what I mean? when he went Ex- to New Jersey. Yeah. Exactly. So I think there's just some guys that are made for college sports and pro sports. For the Cardinals, it's a great win last night. Really a must win. Yeah, they could not afford to go one and four. So now they sit at two and three. You have a week and a half to get Carson Palmer into that concussion protocol and get him ready. For the Jets is their next game. But some of these games coming up for Arizona is extremely tough. So I said they have the Jets next week. Then the week after, they're playing Seattle. Then then Carolina Panthers. They have a game against Minnesota still. They have another game against Seattle. So definitely three, four games where you look on paper that are really losable games, mm-hmm. let alone if you have a major injury or anything there. So an absolutely huge win for Arizona if they want to try and stay near the top half of the nfc bracket tough schedule definitely some games that we thought they would not lose already in the season they did but definitely a good win for the cardinals yeah absolutely all right so now let's look at the rest of the games here in week five of the nfl season so we have the return of tom brady the flight gate is over anthony so we have tom brady going and if it doesn't get any better for the patriots and brady he returns against the cleveland browns so I realize it's a road game, but still, you're returning against the winless, hopeless Browns. Couldn't get any easier for the Patriots. They are my lock of the weekend. Return of Brady, he's angry, he's mad. I expect him to go out there and just light it up, even though he hasn't really gotten any reps within the last four or five weeks. So let me get this straight. Tom Brady gets suspended, four games, all that stuff finally happened to Flakegate that happened, you know, 1999. All long ago, that finally came to fruition. He got suspended four games. All right, cool, fine. Goes to Italy, enjoys himself over in Italy, comes back, 3 and one team. Gronk is relatively healthy now. He didn't have to go through the first four weeks where he was a, either wasn't playing or wasn't doing much when he was playing. Now he comes back, 3 and one team. Team's motivated because they just lost to the Bills. Brady had nothing to do with. Gets a healthy Gronk, and you get the Browns. Yes. Yeah, that's pretty good for him. Yeah, you get to come back against the Browns. The Browns, you know, who whew, they've been kind of bad. The whole year, healthy offense for the most part, healthy defense for the most part. Here you go, Tom. Have fun. Welcome back. Yeah, for the Browns, I guess you could say they've competed in games, but sure. they, they just they. I mean, they're the Browns. I, I can't I can't go any farther than that. So I will give them credit at least because in two of their games they've lost by five and six. So like the Dolphins and Ravens, they've at least been in the games. Right. So there's at least that. You know, yeah, they're 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 competing, and you know, Hugh Jackson is obviously trying to establish himself as a head coach once again, right. as he was with Oakland before. Yeah. So, I mean, they're not going to lay down easily, but I think the Patriots are. They're my lock this week. So then we have the Eagles coming off of a bye week, going in to Ford Field take on the Lions. The Bears are going to take on the Colts after their loss in London last week. Indianapolis one and three. The Bears one and three as well. The Tennessee Titans are going down to Florida to take on the Dolphins. That game is going to happen in Miami, although Mm -hmm. Hurricane Matthew kind of swept through Florida with Miami already, so sort of moving up towards Georgia now So Mm -hmm. and Orlando. But so the Dolphins are still going to be playing at home in that game. The Redskins are going in to M&T Bank Stadium to take on the 3-1 Ravens. The Houston Texans, 3-1 against the Minnesota Vikings, 4-0. That game is in Minnesota. I do like Minnesota this week, although they are on a short week playing last week on Monday night. Right. The Jets and nine interceptions in the last two weeks, Ryan Fitzpatrick, go into Heinz Field to take on the Pittsburgh Steelers, who looked absolutely phenomenal last week with the return of Le'Veon Bell. The Atlanta Falcons, really everybody's surprise team so far, going into Sports Authority Field to take on the Denver Broncos, who are still undefeated. The Cincinnati Bengals are going into AT&T Stadium. Jerry World take on the Cowboys. I think that's one of the best matchups of the weekend. Mm-hmm. I think that'll be a good game. 
The Buffalo Bills are going to L.A. to take on the Rams. Really the surprise 3-1 and Rams and now a game against Buffalo. A winnable game. So you could see the Rams sitting at 4-1 and through five games. I don't think anybody expected that. The San Diego Chargers are going into Oakland in an AFC West battle to take on the Raiders. It seems like the Raiders and the Chargers always play a good game at least one time out of their two meetings every year. So maybe this one will be one of those games. Our Sunday night game is the New York Giants taking on the Green Bay Packers. An absolutely huge, huge game for the Giants. Started off 2-0. Now they lost their last two games to Washington and Minnesota, respectively. And then our Monday night game is the Tampa Bay Buccaneers going in to Bank of America Stadium in Charlotte to take on the Panthers. We're still unsure who the Panthers' quarterback will be, whether it be Derek Carr or Cam Newton with the concussion. So I think that will really determine a lot in my eyes who could win that game. I see... I see Cam Newton playing. I see the Panthers winning. I don't see how they can afford to go one and four. With Derek Anderson, obviously a backup quarterback, there's a lot more a lot more riding on his shoulders, a lot more pressure under him. So you could see a lot of different things happen. But anyways, let's preview a few of these games really quickly. As I said, my lock of the week is New England. It seems like from what you said, it's one of your locks of the week as well. Yeah. One game that I really am looking forward to this weekend, though, is Cincinnati Bengals taking on the Dallas Cowboys. I think that could be a very good game, a really important game for both teams. You look at Dallas still trying to compete there in the NFC East with Philadelphia. A good win last week on the road against San Francisco. And then the Bengals coming off of their win last Thursday against Miami. They have a week and a half to get ready for Dallas. Yeah, so you look at a couple of these games. The one thing that's interesting with the Cowboys playing the Bengals, Dak Prescott still without an interception. Still doing well as a rookie quarterback. So now he's going to go against the Cincinnati defense, which is not too shabby in their themselves. Poor NFL can't get a Monday night football game right. You're going to have Tampa Bay against the Panthers. Maybe if Cam Newton doesn't start, that's probably not going to be a very popular game. Also, you have, which I did, found really weird. Okay, so last week the Colts and the Jaguars played in London, right? The Jaguars basically made their yearly trip up to London. Seems like that. That's what I was saying. It seems like they're always that's what they do. in yeah. England, the mm-hmm. Jaguars. Yeah. But, Every yeah. now and then, other teams follow the Dolphins. Uh, the Cowboys, I think, did it once. Like you know, but mostly it's the Jaguars. At least one of the times, the Jaguars have a bye week because they do that thing where it's like after you have the game, you have your bye week because you got to adjust coming back from England. And everything else, Indianapolis didn't do that. No, Indianapolis. They asked them before you know because they make obviously the schedule way in advance. And they asked him, do you want a bye week like everyone else did? And they said, no, they want to have the normal one, so they're going to have it in week 10. Instead of the normal, like, okay, you got to get reacclimated back to the States. Here's, you know, seven extra days, you know, uh, to rest your body. So I want to see how they do against the Bears. Now, the Bears aren't exactly as good as they used to be. Their defense is bad. Their offense is bad. So maybe it's not going to be as terrible. But I want to see how they do coming, you know, thousands of miles back and forth like that. When I look at the Bears and the Colts, I think a couple of things. Number one, the Colts are a four and a half point favorite. This is mm-hmm. one of those games. If I was a betting man, which I'm not, right. I would I would not even touch mm-hmm. because I don't think either of these teams are very good. And when you have a matchup where both teams are pretty bad, yeah, you have no idea what to expect because the Colts could go up and line them up. The Bears could go in there. Andrew Luck makes a couple of mistakes. The Bears look great, but this could be one of those sloppy games where you have a 16 to 10 victory. So. You never know what to do with bad teams. So right. that's why I would completely leave this game alone. Mm-hmm. When I look at the Colts, I think with the exception of their quarterback play, they probably have one of the worst rosters in the entire league. I realize T.Y. Hilton is probably an above average receiver, but I think a lot of that has to do with Andrew Luck being able to get him the ball. They have no offensive line. They right. have no defense. Frank Gore at the running back has not been terrible, but he's not... Frank Gore is an old, aging running back. He's not in his prime anymore. He's no. not the Frank Gore he was in Frisco. Yeah. So when I look at this team, I f- I feel like Andrew Luck probably gets a lot of the blame, but I think he should probably get none because without Andrew Luck, if you put in a different quarterback with the exception of an elite quarterback like Andrew Luck, like I'll just throw in Ryan Tannehill mm-hmm. because he's like next on the on the thing I'm looking at. Right. So say you throw in Ryan Tannehill there, I think they're probably the worst team in the league. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of it is because their team is so bad, Andrew Luck has to carry the burden that they can sort of compete. But this team is so terrible, so I don't even know what to expect in this game. You mentioned having to travel so much, a little jet lag. The Bears played pretty good last week against Detroit. Brian Hoyer didn't make any mistakes, threw for over 300 yards. So I don't really know what to expect in this game. I guess I'll take the Colts since they're at home. And and with the Bears, you really can't expect much out of them. But I, I have no idea where this game is going. So 
it's just one of those games where you kind of scratch your head at the result and see what happens because you really have no idea what to expect. It's one of those weird things because we saw this in college football, right? We saw this with Les Miles at LSU where last year at the end of the season, I mean, everybody was sure, okay, Pagano is going to get fired because he's had a bad year. Him and Gregson didn't get along. Okay, fine. This is going to finally blow up. He's going to go away. No. Instead, extensions galore. Here you go. We're all coming back. Kumbaya. Everything's going to be great. The same thing in, uh, what do you call it, in LSU. LSU was one of those teams that were struggling all year. They weren't doing what we thought they would do. Les Miles is going to get fired. No, Les Miles didn't get fired. He still stayed there. Didn't work out in LSU. Les Miles lost his job after a poor start. And the same thing's happening in Indianapolis. Like, if everything's that bad, if we're led to believe that everything's that bad in Indianapolis where people can't get along with each other, why would you bring them back? And if they're struggling again, he's going to get fired again. Like, you just kind of extended this thing a little bit longer than what it should have been. Like, you basically stayed together for the kids, and that's clearly not working. And not necessarily bringing them back. I could see them – I could see Jim Ursay maybe bringing back Ryan Gixon and – Right, bringing back one of them, yeah. And Chuck Pagano maybe for a year, you know, because they're still under contract. But then you go and you extend right. their contract. So if you make the decision to cut them loose, you're going to have to pay them right. so much money because you extended their contracts as opposed to just saying, okay – you're still under contract. We'll give you another year. See what happens. Right. You extend them. Yeah. Which makes it that much worse. So I, I think that's. Yeah, their contracts uh, are guaranteed. Colts, it's not like no, players, though. I look at the Colts. I think they have a bad owner, mm-hmm. a bad GM, and a bad coach, and some guy in Chuck Pagano, who's a defensive mind, who's not there to sort of push the progression right. of Andrew Luck. Because if you look at the exception with maybe Jack Del Rio in Oakland, mm-hmm. every young quarterback, what do they have in common? They have an offensive coach. Carson Wentz, Doug Peterson, former quarterback. Dak Prescott, Jason Garrett, former quarterback. Look at Adam Gaze comes in to try and be that quarterback whisperer for Ryan Tannehill. You have when Kaepernick Tampa was good, Bay. he had Harbaugh. Right in Tampa Bay, you have Dirk Cutter to try and help Jameis Winston. Mm-hmm. All these young quarterbacks, with the exception of Derek Carr in Oakland, you have an offensive mind, a right. former quarterback trying to push the progression because this is, this is an offensive league, right. and you need an elite quarterback to get to get far with the exception of maybe Denver, right. Baltimore Ravens in the early 2000s if you have that literally lockdown defense. Yeah. Okay, one game I see on the schedule here that I I see maybe as an upset. I'm going to take the Bills going to L.A. to beat the Rams. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Bills, two wins in a row now. The shutout last week against New England. I realize they're going east coast to west coast. I don't like those, those travels. Mm-hmm. But when I look at the Rams, three and one, having a great season, I still am not. I'm still not sold on this team. I still don't believe in yeah. them. I don't believe in Buffalo either. Right. But I, I still think Buffalo is probably a better team. Now you have Marcel Darius coming back from a four game suspension That'll on help. that defensive line, which is going to help mm-hmm. try and lock down Todd Gurley, which I think they'll do. I think Tyrod Taylor can probably make more plays in Case Keenum. You have Lashawn McCoy as well. So I, I kind of like the Bills in a close game. Yeah, no, I would probably agree with you with that. Like you said, Buffalo's getting their confidence back a little bit. Hypothetically, over the next three weeks, you know, they have the Rams, Niners, and Dolphins. They could be 5-2 and two after that, you know, really get their confidence back after going 0-2. Oh and, and, yeah, I think – here's the thing. Like, I don't trust the Rams either because we saw week one. They were terrible in week one. They didn't score a point in week one. They only scored three points – or, sorry, only nine points in week two. They didn't have a touchdown until week three against Tampa Bay. And now they're two or three and one. They're looking better, but it's just hard to trust that the team they the teams they've beaten have been good because yes, they beat Seattle, but that's all like they do those weird things because they had the tie a couple years ago. So the they Rams go, always play Seattle really yeah, tough. It's a division game and they're always kind of one of those teams. It's just like they will win those games that you're like, wait, how wait, hold on. Like, how did you win that game? But then they'll lose games like 49ers where it's like, oh no, they sh- if they're a good team. They should destroy them instead, flip reverse it. Now it's lost twenty eight to zero. Yeah, I would just say Buffalo because I would just assume that at a certain point, because what they have is a strong defense. They don't have a strong offense. Todd Gurley isn't what we'd hoped he'd be, and Case Keenum is Case Keenum. Right, right. You can't really expect much. And then lastly, I'll look at the Sunday night game. I think that has a matchup where you look at the New York Giants against mm-hmm. the Green Bay Packers. It seems like the Giants always always beat the Packers being a Packers fan of course I follow the team I watch every single game Mm -hmm. the Giants are one of those teams that just always have the Packers number Mm -hmm. they just always play them tough think about the NFC championship game in that first Eli Manning Super Bowl run Mm -hmm. he beats Green Bay in Green Bay 
That second one was when the Packers were 15-1. and one. He goes in in the divisional game and go ahead and beats Green Bay. Leads them to their second Super Bowl. Mm-hmm. Every year in the regular season, we seem to meet maybe once every two three years, and it's always a close, compelling game. Right. Now you fast forward to, to Sunday, Sunday night. You have the Packers coming off of a bye week. I love teams off of bye weeks. Mm-hmm. You have two weeks to repair, two weeks to rest. Right. You have the Giants who are on a short week playing Minnesota last week, probably a little – Minnesota is such a physical team, probably a little sore, a little – a little tired, maybe. I like the Packers in this game. They are at home. Lambeau Field's a huge, huge advantage. And I I like the Giants going into this year. They were my pick to win the NFC East. But right now, I just really can't trust their offense because Eli Manning is still prone to making mistakes. Mm-hmm. He is. He's one of those quarterbacks who, like, he will have great games. He will have terrible games. It just kind of is one of those things. But I would – here's the thing. Whatever happened last week with Odell Beckham, right? Everybody kind of like piranha their way throughout this week to just kind of go at him because of everything he said or everything he was doing on the field, everything else like that. All the stuff we've heard, we heard from Eli, right? He said it's kind of his fault. He needs to not do that kind of stuff. We heard it from old head coach Tom Coughlin about like, I think he needs to do this and that. We've heard it from other people that are around the team, but we haven't really heard it from the other players on offense outside of Peyton or outside of Eli Manning. I think this is kind of one of those galvanizing games for Odell Beckham because basically he's been called out but publicly on blast for everything that he's done. So if he has a bad game, like the media is not going to let up on him. They're going to just go harder like, oh, well, now you're soft. Oh, why can't you do this now? Why aren't you as good as you were before? You can't make those one to catches anymore. Why aren't you this good? So I think this could be one of those, okay, let's get Odell going. He only had, what, 23 yards last week. He had a terrible, terrible, terrible game. Get him going. You know, make this a bit of a shootout because, yes, Eli can throw four interceptions, but he can also throw four touchdowns just depending on the game. I understand that there was a, you know, rest in between. On an upset, I would say the Giants over the Packers. Wow, interesting. Okay, I mean, I honestly can see it happening. It seems like the Giants always beat the Packers. Like I said, they just have their number. But, I mean, as, as always, we'll update you on Monday with the scores and then preview the Monday Night Football game as well between the Buccaneers and the Panthers. We'll obviously have a better indication – of whether Cam Newton will be under center for mm-hmm. Carolina in a huge game, you know, sitting at one and three, the NFC champion last year, really in danger of going off to a really bad start. But with that said, we'll take our first break at the GSMC Sports Podcast. Coming out of the break, we're going to talk baseball playoffs. We had the ALDS games last night. We have game two tonight as well, and then we're leading off the NLDS. We have the Cubs and Giants, and we have the Dodgers and Nationals. Some great pitching matchups as well. So we will preview those games and recap the games last night right after the break at the GSMC Sports Podcast. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back into the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking some baseball. Yesterday, we had two Game 1s in the American League Divisional Series. We had the Toronto Blue Jays absolutely hammering the Texas Rangers 10-1. to Cole Hamels got lit up pretty bad yesterday, gave up seven runs. Marco Estrada pitched very well for Toronto, went eight in a third innings, only gave up one run. So they have a 1-0 to series lead. Game 2 is going to be today in Texas. I honestly think it's a must-win for the Rangers. In a five-game series, the divisional series, you cannot afford to go down 0-2 with both your games at home. The Toronto Blue Jays are going to throw out J.A. Happ, who was their best pitcher all year long, and then Hugh Darvish for the Rangers. Good, solid pitcher, but he's battled so many injuries. Right. Last night, we had the Cleveland Indians beating the Boston Red Sox 5-4 to in Game 1 of that series. Rick Porcello takes the loss. He was the Red Sox' best pitcher all year long, but he did not play good last night. 
And then Andrew Miller comes in in a, in a reliever's role kind of early. He came in in the fifth and sixth inning. I was kind of surprised that they threw him out there that early, Terry Francona. But obviously, it pays off. And the Indians are up 1-0 to zero over the Red Sox. Game two of that series is today as well. We have David Price on the mound for the Red Sox going up against Corey Kluber, who's really, in my eyes, the, the ace of the Indian staff. So a, a big game, I think. To be honest, I really hate these five-game series and divisional series. Because you have a you have a five game series, then in the championship series you have seven, the World Series you have seven. I really hate that there's no consistency there. I feel like if you if you go down 0-2 in a five game series, you're pretty much done. Right. As opposed to a seven game series, you we obviously if you go up 2-0, you have a good good solid advantage, but you have a chance to come back. There's a lot of games left. First one to four, obviously. Mm-hmm. But I, I think in a five game series. Why have a five-game series? I think you need to be more consistent with seven. These guys are playing 162 games in a regular season. What's an extra two in the divisional series? So you want to do how, how basketball does. Basketball used to yes. be the five, seven, seven. You want it just to be seven throughout. Right. I understand the wild card game is a one-game play-in, and I actually right. like that. I think it adds more excitement to it. Mm-hmm. But as far as the, the series go, right. why have the divisional series at five games? And then have the other series at seven. I think there needs to be consistency there. I really don't like that. Yeah, I can understand that because you understand that probably a little bit more with baseball than you do with basketball because basketball you play 82, 162 with baseball. But it's one of those things where it's like baseball players aren't, you know, they're very much, their bodies are used to playing games back to back to back. NBA, you tend to have a couple games rest in between. But yeah, with baseball, I mean, like you said, play today right after they played yesterday. They have a break when they, you know, move uh, cities or whatever. But, yeah, no, I could absolutely see that because and also, I mean, financially it makes more business sense. You're going to make more money off of those games, so I'm surprised baseball doesn't actually do that. Like, yes, you added the one game, you know, for revenue purposes or whatever with that, with the wild card. But, yeah, if you add a couple more, you know, most likely you're probably going to have those games played anyways because a lot of times there aren't sweeps anyways. You're not going to be 4-0 in the first round, especially in this where there's only, you know, six teams that actually make it, you know, if you include the wild card as two. Like that, so I would, yeah, I'd be down for that. Get a couple more games, be a little bit less, you know, sure. Like you said, right now with Cleveland winning and with Texas losing, it's one of those things where Texas has to win and Boston has to win. Like if they go down 2-0, whether you're home or away, it's really hard to come back. Like fine, Boston has a history of coming back from down 3-0, but that was in the seven-game series. Yeah, I'm down for seven games. Yeah, I you make a good point about baseball making more money, more revenue with the games. I've really been kind of critical of baseball's schedule, really. In my eyes, I think 162 games is way too long. Mm-hmm. I would Here's what I would do. I would make the season 100 games. Okay. So what you're doing by that is you're eliminating pretty much two and a half months. with mm-hmm. Because in a, in a month, you're maybe not playing three or four days. So you're eliminating maybe two and a half months. You're speeding up the playoffs. That way, at as opposed to ending at the end of October... You're ending at the end of August. So you're ending right before football because mm-hmm. that's the problem with baseball right now. I realize you have Saturday, you have a matinee between the Dodgers and the the Nationals at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific. And then you have the Giants-Cubs in primetime, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. But what goes on at these those exact same times? College football primetime games. Mm-hmm. The NFL primetime games Sunday night. So you're battling with that. So if you start the season by eliminating 62 games... That speeds up the playoffs. You have the playoffs in August as opposed to October. You're not having to battle anything else. Mm-hmm. So that's what I would do. Obviously, I don't think that's going to happen because right. it, that hasn't happened yet. But yeah. So now let's preview the NLDS series. So we have game one of the Dodgers and Nationals. A game is in the nation's capital. Great pitching matchup. Clayton Kershaw against Max Scherzer. And then we have the Giants going in to Wrigley Field to take on the Cubs. Johnny Cueto on the mound for Frisco against John Lester for the Cubs. Let's talk about the Dodgers National Series first. Okay. What do we like? You know, obviously a great pitching matchup yeah. week one here, or game one, I should say. Kershaw against Scherzer. I think in a, in a short five-game series, if the Dodgers want to have any chance of overcoming their playoff woes of history past, mm-hmm. they have to win when Kershaw's on the mound. Yeah. Kershaw's really struggled in the playoffs. He had a good playoff last year. But before that, he hasn't done too much. Scherzer, we know what we're going to get from him. He's a guy who's capable of giving up hits, but a guy who's going to strike out a lot, a lot of people and overpower a lot of people. I think if the Dodgers want to have any chance to win this series, they have to win when Kershaw is on the mound. 
Other than Kershaw, they don't have much on that pitching rotation. Rich Hill's been good since coming over in the summer on the trade deadline from the A's, but there's not much to really expect or be optimistic about with Hill. And then down there, Kenta Maeda maybe. But with the exception of Kershaw, you don't have any standout aces on that staff. So it's important that you win when he's on the mound. Yeah, so you talk about Clayton Kershaw, and we kind of all know his struggles when it comes to the postseason. But Scherzer hasn't been that great either if you take the whole. If you take everything he's done in the playoffs, all 12 games. Or Sorry, uh, he has 12 and 10. Uh, no, sorry, he's 12 games started, 12 games, 10 games started. He's only 5 and 7, and his ERA is 3.73. So he's hit or miss when it comes to the playoffs. His last time he went seven and a third innings, gave up five earned runs before that, six and a third innings, gave up three earned runs. So he's been okay, and before that gave up one earned run, one earned run, two earned runs. So he's been hit and miss when it comes to these things like that, right? So everything with Kershaw, you know, Kershaw is basically the reverse of Midas and Bumgarner, really good in the regular season. So-so in the postseason, Bumgarner so-so good, but not great in the regular season and just lights out, maybe the best we've ever seen. In the playoffs, both of them have just overpowering stuff on any given night. And with the differences, we have to see how, what's his name, Uh, Bryce Harper will do. Because Bryce Harper went from MVP candidate, one of the best seasons we've ever seen from a young player. Basically, his batting average almost dropped down 100 points. Like, he struggled a lot. And I understand he had injuries and stuff like that. But we got to see how he does. Because if he can do anything, that swings the balance. Because who on the Dodgers is going to be that guy. You see, Puig can hit it out of the park, but he's not been consistent. You know, you had someone who they've had before the start of the year with the Dodgers. You had someone like a Jock Peterson who last year started off good and then just totally fell off a cliff. You have people for the Dodgers pitching wise, like you said, Kershaw, maybe the best we've ever seen as far as in the regular season. But as far as home runs go, you basically have Justin Turner, who's had a good year. Yasmani Grandal, okay, Corey Seager, Jock Peterson, Gonzalez, stuff like that. But none of them have been as consistent as you'd hope they would be. So you would have to basically rely on the pitching. You would hope that the pitching could come through. And for the Dodgers, you are throwing a lot of hope at Kershaw because if he can stabilize that pitching staff, if he can do what Bumgarner did, that sets up everything else because now you have that one game, everything's good, and you can go from there. Yeah, I honestly think that if the Dodgers could not win when Kershaw's on the mound, I think they're screwed right. because – Without without Kershaw, every other pitcher there, you don't really know what to expect. Mm-hmm. With Kershaw, you have to expect that he's going to go out like people did in the NL wildcard game, Noah Syndergaard and Bumgarner, and just right. absolutely shut teams down. And you need that. With If he can't do that, then I think the Dodgers are in a world of hurt, although they did win the NL West when everybody thought the Giants would. Corey Seager had a great season, but yeah, he's still a rookie, so you have him in his first postseason. have to see how he'll do. Right. But So I think tonight's a big game, and then tomorrow as well for Game 2. They're throwing Rich Hill out on the mound. Not sure who the Nationals are going to start. They haven't named anyone yet, but obviously they'll have to wait and see. I think whoever can win tonight mm-hmm. I think is in a really good position, especially if the Nationals win because you got to Kershaw. You mm-hmm. beat Kershaw, whether right. whether he gets the loss or not. You beat a start where Kershaw was playing. That's That's got to be huge. Yeah. So as I mentioned – Going into the weekend, we have Game 1s tonight in the NLDS and Game 2s in the ALDS. Mm -hmm. And then tomorrow, we have the Game 2 in the NLDS. And then Sunday, we have Game 3s in the American League Divisional Series. And then on Monday, we kind of have all four games. So on the weekends, we have the NL side on Saturday, the AL side on Sunday. Mm -hmm. Now let's talk about, to end the segment, Giants-Cubs. I think really... As of all the DS series, I think on the American League side, you look at Toronto and Texas because of their history last year and what happened in the middle of the season between Ronet Odor and Jose Batista. Right. But on the divisional side of all series, especially on the NL side, I think this is probably the best and intriguing matchup. You have the Cubs, who were the best team in baseball all year long, 100-plus wins. The Giants, who at the All-Star break had the best record, and in the second half just kind of the wheels fell off and right. they squeaked by to get in as a wild card you have the even year believe in whatever hashtag believe in whatever right. you know 2010 2012 2014 Bumgarner, one of the best historically best postseason pitchers of all time era sub one against all these horses the cubs throw out there and their hitters chris bryant anthony rizzo i think if there's one team that gives the cubs fits it's the giants especially in a short series because you have 
you have with the Giants, obviously, you have Cueto and John Lester is the game one matchup. In game two, the Cubs are throwing out Kyle Hendricks. The Giants haven't named a starter yet. you got to think it's going to be Jeff Samarja. Mm-hmm. So then for game three, maybe you throw out Madison Bumgarner there on a short rest. Right. Against Jay Garrietta. It looks like that's going to be the, the case here on Monday. That might depend on how game one and two go. If the Giants are up 2-0, maybe they tell them, okay, you know, you can have your regular rest, throw Matt Moore. You know, maybe they'll three. play him game four then because right. Bumgarner, you got to go with history. You got to think he's going to put on a great performance. Yeah. So I think if there's one team that gives the, the Cubs fits, it's the Giants because they can match that starting pitching mm-hmm. with the Cubs like no other team can. The yeah. Giants, in my eyes, can't hit. They don't have anybody over 300 average. But as you saw on Wednesday in the National League wildcard game, it only takes one hit to get it done. You have Connor Gillespie's three run home right. run in the ninth. So I think this is going to be a really intriguing matchup. I honestly expect it to go five games. I seriously do. Yeah, I would like if you are forget about the Cubs themselves because you see how good Rizzo and Brian and everybody else, Addison Russell and the team have been doing. But if you're a fan of the Cubs, right? Forget about the history of the Cubs and oh, they haven't won since 1908. Okay, that all's fine. This probably gives you the most fear of anybody, right? Because like you talk about the Nationals, teams been up and down, offense, you know. Something like Harper has been the same. The Dodgers, you don't know if Kershaw can be Kershaw. Seager's a rookie, everything else like that. The Giants probably are the one team that gives you the most, like, fear, do they not? Like, because forget about the, you know, hitting because, like you said, no one's above 300. The only offense they had last night was off of Connor Gillespie. And if you had any idea that he would do anything, you're a liar. Like, no one thought he was going to be the guy that got the hit. You would think Pence, uh, Buster Posey before that. You know, you would think even Brandon Belt, someone like that, maybe even Pagan way before you got over to Gillespie, but the pitching, whether it is Bumgardner, which we understand how great he is, Cueto, we've seen as good as he can be this year, even someone like Jeff Samarja, who, by the way, former Cub, may want to get some revenge, stuff like that. You know, you've seen the pitching be, at least at certain points, lights out. Forget about the bullpen. The starting pitching at certain points have been lights out, and that's the one thing you see in the playoffs. You can have a fantastic offense. You can have the greatest offense in the history of time. You know, you can have a great uh, stretch throughout the regular season you saw like in 01 the Seattle Mariners running through everybody once they get in the playoffs no like you've seen recently just because you have the best record in the league doesn't mean you're going to do well in the playoffs and you know if I were the Cubs you got to worry a little bit okay these three guys because you only really need three starters in the playoffs these three are as good as anybody anybody's got yeah I, I definitely I mean if the Cubs even go four you can throw in John Lackey right who has eight active postseason wins. That's definitely yeah. really good. And he's just a wily veteran. He's been there before. He's won a World Series. So you have Arietta, you have Lester, you have Kyle Hendricks. In my eyes, Kyle Hendricks, probably the favorite to right. win the Cy Young Award on the NL side. Mm-hmm. And even Jason Hamill this year, who's been really good for the Cubs, I think he'll probably be a, a long reliever role. Yeah. But still, they have five guys out there who are capable of absolutely shutting teams down. And you've seen that all year long. I do think it's going to go five games. I have to pick the Cubs, though, because of their pitching staff. I think they have better hitting. I think their bullpen is 100 million times better than the Giants. Sure. You throw Hector Rondon. You throw Araldis Chapman. The Giants' bullpen has been really a disaster all year long. 30 yeah. blown saves. Sergio Romo's done well since he came into that closer right. role the last few weeks of the season. But I have to go with the history here of this of this season, I should say. Not the history of the Cubs never winning. but Totally. So I'll take the Cubs. I think it's going five games. I really do. I think every game is going to be close, competitive. I think the first team to three in every game, every game seriously will win that game. Mm-hmm. So I got to take the Cubs. So close, yeah. close series. And I can't, like, whatever I say, if I say, oh, I think the Giants are going to win, I'll admit I'll be biased on that because I am a Giants fan. So if I say, I think, oh, I think the Giants will win, like, I'm not fully coming on that as unbiased. Like, there is a bit of, like, I would like that to happen. And, yeah, like, if you just go mathematically and, you know, betting-wise, not that I'm a betting man, just saying through with that, like, you would have to go with the Cubs. Yeah, I got I to gotta take the Cubs. You know, I, they've just been the best team all year long. But with that being said, we'll take our second break. And on Monday after the weekend break, we will be updating these divisional series. I expect a lot of great games. And we've seen that so far. You know, yesterday in the American League, 5-4 to four with Boston and Cleveland, a really competitive game. Mm-hmm. Toronto – and Texas, not so much, but it's just one game. I have to see how the rest of sort of these series go. We'll update you here at the GSMC Sports Podcast. So after our last break, we're going to be talking about college football. A lot of great matchups this, this week, one particular in the SEC that I have my eyes on between Texas A&M and Tennessee. We'll preview that and more right after the break at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. 
Want to find out what movies to go see? Then check out the GSMC Movie Podcast. It's your ticket to the latest movies, whether it's a new blockbuster event, romantic, comedy, or action flick. This show has got it all covered. They talk some what to go see now. Don't bother. What's hot on Netflix and everything in between? That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash movie dash podcast. When it's all about the movies, it has to be this new show. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. And we are back here at the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast for Anthony. I am Ben. Going to talk here in our last segment of the show about college football. A lot of good, good matchups. So tonight we have Clemson coming off of their big, big win over Louisville on Saturday. They're taking on Boston College. A tough road game, you know, in prime time. We've seen crazier things. I do expect Clemson to handle BC, right. though. And then number 19, Boise State goes into New Mexico to face New Mexico. Boise State undefeated, 19th in the country, 4-0 against New Mexico, who's 2-2. Two and two. So then we have some great games this weekend. So the Florida LSU game is actually canceled, postponed, because of Hurricane Matthew. So they'll mm-hmm. have to have some sort of makeup day. Right. Obviously, you have to look at when they're both on a bye week or near the end of the season, maybe they have that. Mm-hmm. It could be a really important game. You know, LSU really played good under interim coach Ed Orgeron last week. And then Florida is sitting at 4-1, and one, 18th in the country. Could be an important game later on. All right, the first game we should preview is the game right in the morning, 9 a.m. Pacific, 12 Eastern. We have the Red River Rivalry. We have the Texas Longhorns against the number 20-ranked Oklahoma Sooners. Both teams come in at 2-2. Two and two. Kind of, really, both teams that have are, you're looking at them kind of disappointing this year. Texas, their great win week one over Notre Dame, but now we see Notre Dame's not really nearly the team we thought they would be at the start right. of the season. Oklahoma lose two really tough games to Houston and to Ohio State, but then they rebounded last week and beat TCU on the road, fifty-two to forty-six. But I still, I still thought that was a good win against a ranked opponent on the road. A tough team like TCU has been good the last few years. I, I got to go with Oklahoma here. I just really can't trust Texas. I, I mean, really, I can't trust either of these teams. Right. But I think I can probably trust Oklahoma a little more than Texas. Baker Mayfield played really well. I think he has the edge with the quarterback battle over Shane Bichelle and Tyrone Swoops, how they do the Texas 18-wheeler package, whatever they want to call it. And I think this is a big game for both coaches. You have Charlie Strong at Texas, and then you have Bob Stoops at Oklahoma. Charlie Strong, a big win last year in this game when no one thought they would. And now you have Bob Stoops, who kind of been on that bubble on the hot seat a few years now with the Oklahoma job. A big, important win over your rival would really help him in that favor. Yeah. So, did you watch wrestling back in the day? Like I'm talking I like, still watch wrestling. Awesome. My man. <laughs> now, here's the thing. There used to be these things like loser leaves town matches, right? That's basically what they're going to do with this game, right? Because Charlie Strong has been on the hot seat because, yes, he beat Notre Dame. But we've kind of seen that Notre Dame isn't what we thought they would be. Oklahoma, like, they're always good for losing a couple of games that you don't think they should lose. I mean, yes, you know, Bob Soup's won a national title back in 2000. But ever since then, he would just always lose these games. Like, he'd get momentum, momentum, momentum. No. And he would, you know, you'd look at Bob Soup's as, like, you know, why are you keep losing these games? Charlie Strong, he fired his defensive coordinator because outside of the win against UTEP, Every game, they've given up at least 49 points. And now you're going to a game in Oklahoma. Oklahoma ranked 20th in the nation. You know, they've had some good games, right? They've had some bad games, right? But they've also had situations while, even though they lost to Houston, you know, they lost to Ohio State, but they beat TCU, like you said, 52-46. to So they can score points as well. So you probably would figure this game is probably going to be in that range of probably like maybe not 50 points again, but maybe like a – you know, 35 to 31 kind of a game, like really high scoring, stuff like that. I would go with Oklahoma. You have a little bit more kind of confidence with them, even though confidence may not be the right word. You just assume that they're just a little bit better of a team than Texas because outside of that one win that they had against Notre Dame, which, you know, beginning they were like, oh, Texas is back. We love Texas and everything else like that. Since that game, you know, they lost to Cal. They lost to Oklahoma State. It's not been as smooth sailing as we thought it would be. And Charlie Strong basically, I don't think he's going to get fired midseason, but if he loses to, say, Oklahoma, then he has Baylor later on in the year. He's got West Virginia. Like, he most likely, if he loses, say, two of those games, won't be back. 
It's it's definitely tough, you know, in his third year now. You really look at with college in particular, you have three years to kind of turn the program around. Obviously, right. you have to bring in your own recruits, your style of play. And now he's done that in his third year now. So I think he's definitely on the hot seat. And you look at Texas, that's an elite college football job. There's a lot of candidates out there. You have Tom Herman with Houston. You have right. Les Miles, who's recently unemployed. Just sitting out there. I waiting. talked about Chip Kelly with San Francisco. I think if he went back to college at Texas, that would be just literally a match made in heaven. Don't ever forget about Lane Kiffin. Lane Kiffin's yeah, always Lane, waiting. Lane Kiffin, he's always waiting. offensive coordinator at Alabama, he's, I think he'll get a head coaching job eventually mm -hmm. this year, although he's kind of had his issues with the NFL and in college. But, yeah. So that obviously a tough, tough game. They're both on the hot seat. I think Charlie Strong's hot seat's a little more warm than Bob Stoops' is, but with a win over your rival again for a second year in a row, that would definitely help. Mm -hmm. All right, now let's talk about the Tennessee Volunteers going on the road to Kyle Field to take on Texas A&M in College Station, the 12th man. One of the toughest atmospheres to play in in college football is Texas A&M Field, Kyle Field. Tennessee, I just – we talked about it on the show last week. The one team I just cannot understand – in college football this year is Tennessee, and yet they do it again. Right. They go down 17 to Georgia. Mm -hmm. They come back and score at the end of the half. Then you have Georgia kind of completing a Hail Mary-esque play, a, a long run with a touch, a touchdown and then a long run, yards after catch, to yep. score with 10 seconds left to take a three-point lead. And then you have Tennessee completing a Hail Mary at the end of the game to win the game and stay undefeated. Mm -hmm. So yet they go down again double digits. Mm -hmm. Come back and find a way to win. They're still five and zero. I don't know how. Then you have Texas A and M who are doing things a lot more sort of conventional, right. winning all their games. I gotta like the Aggies in this game. I realize Tennessee has been kind of the, that one team you can't bet against this yep. year because they're gonna go down and then come back. But that's gotta come back to haunt them eventually. And I think it's this week against the Aggies. Tough atmosphere. You have Trevor Knight who's hasn't been great throwing right. the ball. You know, just a, a, around a 50% completion percentage, but he can run as well. So I think that you have the added bonus. The Texas A&M defensive front and that pass rush is ferocious. The Tennessee offensive line is really, really suspect. I got to think that Texas A&M can sort of build a lead and at least hold it to a certain aspect because I just can't trust Tennessee, at least in the first half. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, Tennessee is basically the version of the buddy of yours who always likes to date crazy chicks. Like, it's always kind of chaos around him. Like, it's like, why do you do this? It's like, eh, it's kind of fun. Like, they get down, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they're winning the game. So, yeah, conventionalism, I would say Texas A&M. I can't go against Tennessee. Like, I can't. Like, you wow. Beat, like, like, here's the thing. So, you have, you know, the wins in the beginning of the year against Appalachian State. Cool, fine. But even that was kind of chaotic, and they maybe shouldn't have won that game. Beat Virginia Tech. Awesome, cool, fantastic. Beat Ohio. You should beat Ohio. Florida, Georgia, both of them should have lost the game slowly keep coming back. Georgia was just one of those, like, literally, like, a Hail Mary, like one of those games where they should have lost the game. You got Texas A&M, and now, don't get me wrong, next week is Alabama. No, they're not winning that one. That's when the luck runs out. That's when Cinderella loses her slipper, all that good stuff. But for this week, I can't go against Alabama. Or Alabama, Tennessee, because both of them are undefeated, both 5-0, and it's not like it's really an upset. One's ranked 9, one ranked 8. Like, it's not that much of an upset. I can't go against Tennessee, even if they're down thirty-one to ten. Nope, they're coming back. Nope, I can't I can't do it. Like that's just one of those teams. It's like, oh, okay, let's wait for this to happen. Like, because even if it becomes, let's say they're only down seven with like six minutes to go, you know the like offense is like, yeah, that's fine. We got dead set. That's fine. All right, we'll get this. Like total confidence in their team because why wouldn't they have confidence in the team? Right. I guess I guess you can throw that in there, but I I gotta like the Aggies. I think I understand. Tennessee sort of. I wouldn't say philosophy, but the way they play has got to come back to haunt them. And I think on the road, a tough atmosphere. I think if they go down by 10, I think they're done because I think the crowd and that defense is really just going to eat them alive then. So another intriguing match that we have is in the ACC. We have number 10, Miami. It's great to see the U ranked back right. highly up after their sort of fall off since early 2000s. But they're taking on Florida State, who are ranked 23 after their loss at home last week to North Carolina. I don't really know what to expect in this game. Florida State's not nearly as good as we thought at the start of the season. Dalvin Cook's a great, great running back. He's one of the best in college football. Right. 
But their defense is what's really hurting them right now. They just really can't stop anybody. They gave up 37 points at home last week to North Carolina. Mm-hmm. Miami, you know, under Mark Rick, I thought he was a, I thought he was a good coach at Georgia. Kind of got a bad rep because he couldn't win a lot of big games. But in the SEC, it's so tough. You know? Right. That's With the exception the of Saban, no one else has really been able to compete. Mm-hmm. So I think he's a good coach, and I think he'll tur- help turn Miami around. But I think it'll take a couple of years. He's doing great right now, but I really don't think Miami's played anyone, anybody that great so far. They are at home against Florida State, so I guess I'll take them because of that. But I really don't know where to go in this game. I could really see anything happening. So it's a night game, 8 o'clock if you're going to be in Miami for it. It's 8 o'clock at night. You got the whole day to prepare. Miami, Brad Kaya, who's not been – like he's been a pretty good quarterback. You know, 9 or 35 yards, 8 touchdowns, 3 interceptions. You know, you have a good running back situation. You have a kind of a dual head running back because you got Yearby on one side, you got Walton on the other. Both of them have been okay to start the year. Their defense hasn't been bad. They got two touchdowns last week on defensive touchdowns. So, and I think they have three linebackers who are starting who are freshmen. So they have people who Mark Ricks brought in. You know, it's one of those different things compared to Charlie Strong, right? Charlie Strong's in year three, still hasn't totally got it on track. First year, you know, with uh, um, with Mark Rick, he's been able to take. The players that Al Golden had last year kind of molded in his style because you said the one thing with Mark Rick was, oh, you can never win the big one. Well, a lot of people couldn't win the big one. The one year that LSU won the national title with her, uh, with uh, Les Miles, he had Saban's players. So it's one of those things of like Saban's basically been the cheat code of all of the SEC. Like he's been the one that's done well. Every now and then you get like a, you know, uh, Tennessee that's done a little bit well. You get LSU that's popped up a little bit. Get you get Texas A and M who's popped up a little bit. Basically, the only two people that have been able to succeed in the SEC for a prolonged period of time have been Urban Meyer and Nick Saban. That's it. So you can't really give Mark Rick that much, you know, damage for what he's done. He's come into Miami. He's been, you know, four and zero. That's as good as you can do. That's you know, maybe they fall off against FSU, but being in Miami, having a little bit of you know, the FSU week is one of those things in Miami where they always kind of get amped, get prepared for it. Same thing as like a Red River rivalry. It's Alabama. Versus Auburn, it's one of those games where it's just like, no, this is the focus. This is what we're going to do. And like you said, Dalvin Cook, fantastic. Like 635 yards already, just really fantastic. But being at home, I would take Miami. Okay, I I, I think it could go either way. I believe that both these teams are really capable. Mm-hmm. Florida State's not nearly as good as we thought they were. They really dropped off. I couldn't imagine them really going 3-3 three and three under Jimbo Fisher. Right. But anything can happen. I think Washington's maybe on upset alert this week after a great win last week against Stanford. Oregon missed Chip Kelly more than they'll ever think. Right. Mark Halfridge is not really getting it done. Oregon's sitting at 2-3. and three. They would lose three games in two years under yeah. Chip Kelly. Going on the road is Washington into the zoo to face Autzen Stadium and that crowd in Eugene. One of the best in college football. I do think Washington are going to win that game, but I think it could be a close— I think it could be one of those trap games. Coming off an emotional high of winning that game— on the road, you know that the crowd's going to be crazy there in Oregon because they always are. Right. So that's one game I could see as a trap game. I like Colorado on the road this week against USC. Mm-hmm. I think Clay Heldon's probably fired by the end of the year. There's so many good coaches that are going to be available. I think USC is still an elite job. They're going to have to cough up a lot of money, for obviously, with firing firing him and then bringing someone in. But yeah. I, I think... I think he's probably done at USC. I like Colorado on the road. They're a much improved team. USC, I just can't trust. Mm -hmm. So I think that's probably my upset of the week. But there's not really too many marquee games this week. Last week, we really got spoiled. There's a few, as we mentioned, in in the SEC and the ACC. But with the exception of that, you know, obviously we'll see if some more compelling storylines come out. We'll update you on Monday with our show and our segment here with the new AP Top 25 rankings. But... It's still going to be a good week college football. There's a lot of great games, a lot of compelling storylines. Yeah, if I had to do an upset, like I know you were talking about Washington, Oregon, I would pick Oregon actually to win that game just because what happened with Washington, like we didn't know if they were good when they started the year, right? Well, we knew they were good, but what I mean is like, you know, they had the wins against Rutgers and Idaho, and that's fine. But then you had Arizona, which they barely won. Like they had to squeak out that game, and I understand it was in Arizona, and we thought going into Stanford, oh, not going into Stanford, but playing Stanford, you know, this might be the game where they, you know, finally lose, and then they just blew them out 44-6 to six at Oregon. If it was at Washington, I would lead more towards Washington would be at Oregon, and Oregon's lost three in a row, which doesn't look good for them. But I would, if upset-wise, I would say Oregon over Washington. Yeah, I think that could be a trap game. Oregon's definitely not easy to win at. Mm-hmm. 
and they still have a high powered offense. They still run that that up tempo scheme. Right. So I do think Washington are going to win. I think they're still a great team. I think Chris Peterson's a great coach, and the the Huskies will see as the season goes on if they're really legit. Ranked number five right now. If they keep winning, they're a lock for the college football playoff. So right. maybe if they they sort of let up and lose a game, we'll have to see what happens. But we'll always update you as that goes on. So that's going to end the show for today. I thought it was a great show. A lot of great, great debates and segments going on. Talk some NFL, college football, some baseball. We will be back on Monday to update you on really a lot of those same things as Mm -hmm. well as everything else in the world of sports. So for the GSMC Sports Podcast, I am Ben. And I'm Anthony. And we hope you have a great weekend and enjoy the show. Goodbye, guys. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Sports Podcast. Part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. From movies to music, from sports to entertainment, and even weird news. You can also follow us on Twitter and on Facebook. Thank you, and we hope you have enjoyed today's program.